A very good morning to all of you. Welcome to the CPD webinar series organized by Society for Health Research and Innovation. First, let me introduce you with the housekeeping rules. Webinar link will be available from 9.15 a.m. to 9.45 a.m. to you to join in. No late attendees will be entertained thereafter. Each attendee should have been attended till the end of the webinar to obtain the certificate for CPD points and the CPD points are strictly adhered to the NCCPD guidelines. These rules are to improve and maintain the standards of the CPD programs conducted by SRI. And thank you in advance for this strict adherence. You can ask questions at the end of the webinar. And if you have a specific question, you can type it in the chat function. And you can email us on office313 at gmail.com. So today's topic is fundamentals of cardiac surgery for primary care. The guest speaker for today is Dr. Paul in the Bandarage, consultant cardiothoracic surgeon, teaching hospital Jaffna. Over to you, sir. Uh, good morning, colleagues, and uh, I'm uh, Dr. Paul in the Bandarage, consultant cardiothoracic surgeon. And uh, today, I am going to discuss with you some uh, basics about uh, basics on cardiac surgery that will be applicable uh, for your primary care management and uh, whatever the specialty you are, because uh, cardiac surgery itself is not the most uh, common topic of day-to-day -to -day practice. And I wouldn't like you to uh, like to. Uh, uh, bore with you on technical details, but uh, the the idea is most of our surgeons and most of our I mean uh, the, the surgical patients once they are discharged to the community end up um, presenting to I mean for various other reasons will present you in uh, in your own practices for uh, non related um, medical problems and these cardiac surgery if they had undergone cardiac surgery most of the time there are some lifetime implications they may be on um, antiplatelets anticoagulants and they may have a valve inside there and uh, um, the sternotomy uh, and uh, the, the major surgery may have some implications so it's always useful for you to know um, some basics about what these patients have undergone and uh, that will help you to uh, manage the patient without comprom compromising uh, our long-term care. And uh, uh, at the same time, you can optimize your, your uh, care on the patient. So to start with, the scope of cardiac surgery involves um, mainly coronary revascularization, that is uh, coronary artery bypass grafting, which is the bread and butter of uh, the cardiac surgeons. And it involves on-pump, CABG as well as uh, off pump CABG. And there is minimally access, access uh, CABG also. Then, um, valve surgery is also a, a relatively common, common surgery that we perform, although not as common as uh, um, revascularization. Then, congenital cardiac surgery is uh, a, specialist, a specialty in itself. So, I won't dwell too much on that uh, in this presentation. Then rarely we come across cardiac tumors that has to um, has to come out. Uh, another important thing is aortic surgery, and uh, in this uh, there's there are some facts that uh, you all should know. Aortic, uh, for example, aortic dissection is commonly diagnosed in our population these days. I mean, not not as common as you would think, but it's getting commoner because uh, mostly the um, undiagnosed hypertension in the young population. And we currently we can um, offer these patients surgical repair, and to have a good knowledge on the uh, on uh, how to uh, manage these patients and how to direct these patients for surgery is vital in the primary for the primary care um, uh, physicians. Cardiac trauma, of course, you, you any of you can uh, come across this, and we'll briefly discuss that. So cardiac management involves the heart team. And uh, obviously, the cardiologist 
plays a very important role, a key role. And when you when you diagnose some cardiac um, uh, pathology in your practice and uh, direct the patient to the cardiologist, he or she will uh, investigate the patient and uh, uh, confirm the diagnosis. And then we'll have a discussion uh, in the heart team meeting with the surgeons, cardiologists, and we will get involved the electrophysiologists who uh, will always help us. The intensivist physicians, and uh, depending on the patient's condition, we, we will involve uh, uh, many other uh, specialists in different fields. So at the end, we will decide uh, what's the best uh, management uh, option for these patients. And uh, almost always, they have a surgical option, intervention, uh, the option of cardiac intervention. And sometimes we, we have to go with uh, non-surgical medical management. So starting with uh, CABG, coronary revascularization. Uh, it, the coronary disease starts with uh, a presentation of um, chest pain, maybe acute or chronic, depending on whether it's an angina or a, uh, or a non stimulant or a myocardial infarction. So they will come to you and then um, starting with the ECG and the toponym, uh, the patient might end up with the cardiologist in the cardiac center. And there they will, um, the patient usually uh, goes in the uh, cath lab and there uh, the, uh, the cardiologist will might, uh, if the patient's lucky, uh, will manage with uh, primary PCI and uh, the patient uh, prognosis will become better. And uh, at this point, the coronary angiogram will reveal what, what is the exact uh, coronary pathology. Uh, in a patient who, who has uh, chronic coronary artery disease presenting with angina, uh, they might, uh, that will be office presentation, uh, a routine presentation, and the patient will have a routine coronary angiogram. And this is at, it is at this point where the coronary angiogram happens that uh, we, the surgeons, come into play. Um, that's one fact. The coronary angiogram involves, this is done by the cardiologists. And uh, this involves uh, catheterizing the usually the radial artery or the tumor axis, and then uh, they inject the uh, negotiate the ostia of the uh, right or left coronary um, coronary arteries, and this contrast is injected to uh, il eliminate the coronary artery. This is what you see in a normal coronary artery. This is the right side, and this is the left side. Usually, it's a, it's a moving uh, video. But I prefer it to have you have to uh, like show it in a still picture. And uh, you you might have heard that CT coronary angiogram has a place in assessing the coronary obstructions, coronary pathologies. But if you are to offer if you are to offer any uh, intervention, currently uh, the patient has to undergo uh, coronary angiogram, uh, contrast angiogram. So this is a normal coronary angiogram. And another point is that uh, you know that in, uh, in the medical school, we learn about uh, the right coronary artery and the left coronary artery. But uh, you would have seen pa uh, patients having diagnosed uh, to have triple vessel disease. So that comes up when the, uh, because in the left coronary artery, uh, that uh, has a uh, that supplies most of the important aspect, uh, parts of the heart, the left ventricle, uh, this uh, interventricular septum, which is uh, which has a thicker muscle mass and which has an increased uh, higher uh, oxygen demand. And for this reason, if there is any obstruction in this uh, territory, there will be um, um, more critical um, uh, outcome in the in the myocardial infarction. So. Uh, the left anterior descending artery, which is uh, in the interventricular groove, is taken as a separate entity uh, as opposed to the circumflex branch, which goes in the atrioventricular groove. And uh, these are taken as two separate vessels and adding up the right coronary artery. Uh, these are the three vessels that we uh, discuss as triple vessel, uh, the triple vessels in, in uh, cardiology. 
out of these the left anterior descending artery uh, supplies the septum with interventricular septum with septal branches you might see them uh, perpendicular here and then it's, it gives out uh, diagonal branches so this supplies the most important part of the heart the septum and the anterior uh, left ventricular myocardium so any pathology in this vessel uh, has to be managed uh, with a uh, with a uh, higher priority this is what this is uh, what you see in a in a abnormal coronary angiogram. There's a long segment of uh, disease, the first level with plaques, and there's thin uh, critical stenosis with thin only thin uh, lumen uh, remaining. And further down, you can see another uh, critical stenosis. So we have to to revascularize this patient. Uh, if, uh, percutaneous intervention may be. Uh, uh, difficult. So, you, what we usually do is to uh, offer the patient a bypass graft where a new um, a conduit uh, harvested from the patient's own body will be anastomosed up uh, around this point at the bottom end and the proximal end will, end, uh, will be anastomosed to the aorta. So, there will be a bypassing of these uh, obstructions and blood supply will be uh, um, there will be re revascularization of the uh, affected areas. This is uh, a diffuse disease uh, condition. Usually, the diabetic population tends to get uh, because the pathology affects the whole length of the coronaries. They have diffuse coronary plaques, and most of the time, uh, they have to undergo CABG. And in this case, we have to uh, bypass all these blocks in this area, and we might land. Uh, can do it somewhere here, and this would uh, revascularize the, uh, the heart. So, in the heart team discussion, we would uh, discuss now. You would have wondered uh, now there's uh, the stenting option, and then there's the bypass option. So, um, what is ideal for the for the patients? And uh, usually, in the heart team discussion, we we follow the guidelines from the. Um, European Society of Cardiology and uh, EX, uh, European Association of Cardiothoracic Surgeons, and uh, the American guidelines, AHA guidelines of the American Heart Association goes parallel to this. So there are set guidelines coming from a um, uh, uh, wide range of uh, studies. Recently, uh, there, uh, recently you have about, heard about the uh, Excel trial, which uh, was the most recent and had a bit of a discussion going on. I wouldn't uh, waste time on uh, technical details, but this is the uh, uh, ESC guideline. And there you will see that uh, single vessel disease, if it's a single vessel disease, uh, the best option would be undergoing PCI for intervention by the cardiologist. But if the LAD is involved, there's still a place for uh, CABG. And when it comes to um, two vessel disease, Again, PCI will be a good option unless there is a critical uh, involvement of the LAD. Again, where the uh, CABG is uh, indicated with class one evidence. Uh, when it comes to more severe disease, when the left main is involved, left main is the uh, uh, segment of the left coronary artery before uh, the left anterior descending and the circumflex branches get divided. There, from usually. Uh, we assess the, uh, the cardiologists actually assess the uh, severity of the blocks with the syntax score. And uh, the higher the syntax score, it's the worse the um, obstruction is and the dif more difficult it's, it, it is to offer uh, perioneous interventions. So CABG, from that point onwards, CABG is uh, a class one indication with level A evidence. And uh, especially for diabetics, when there's uh, three vessel disease, or, um, it's uh, because they have diffuse disease, uh, CABG is again um, the best option. And um, uh, PCI still has a place, but in some instances, you would see that there's a class three or severe, uh, severe disease, and uh, CABG is prioritized for these kind of uh, patients. But there are some instances where the patient cannot, the patient is unable to 
undergoing ABG and, and those instances we discuss and offer them the best uh, possible treatment. Uh, this, um, uh, the DX guidelines might offer you, um, uh, if you are interested, uh, in addition to the surgical uh, surgical facts, uh, you, you will uh, there will be detailed um, uh, guidelines on uh, revascularization of the heart for a disease. So, going back to CABG, uh, this cartoon shows where uh, there are uh, single grafts, double, triple, quadruple, and sometimes uh, there are instances we have to do five grafts. So. In all these uh, instances, you would note that a graft coming from the first uh, segment of the subclavian is getting anastomosed to the LAD, and that is there in almost all, uh, in, in all these uh, instances. So this is the left internal mammary. It's an artery running uh, about two centimeters lateral to the uh, internal edge on your chest wall bo in, bo on both sides just uh, uh, posterior to the post, uh, post uh cartilages. So um, this is a very important uh, graft, a conduit, because for one reason, it's an elastic artery uh, compared to, as opposed to an, a muscular artery, you would remember in your uh, histology, because uh, the, this tends to remain patent and the endothelium of this vessel, the left internal mammary, produces a lot of uh, nitric oxide. And this nitric oxide will keep the vessel itself patent. And also, uh, it will help the uh, downstream coronaries to, to be um, kept patent. So, this has a very high uh, patency rate. And in the uh, current studies, even at uh, 15 years, it has been found that uh, more than 95, almost up to 98% uh, of the uh, Lima LAD graphs have been patented even by 15 years. So it's a very, very high success rate. And this is the fact, this is the reason why CABG is uh, maintaining its uh, position as a very good option for revascularization in coronary uh, artery disease. Then for the rest, uh, the, 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 this graft, Universally goes for LAD, left anterior descending artery, because as I mentioned earlier, it's the most important of the coronary vessels. So the rest of the conduits are usually harvested uh, uh, from the available other vessels. Right internal memory is also there. And uh, whenever possible, we offer right internal memory graft uh, to young patients. But we, because we have to uh, mobilize it to the left side of the heart, it involves a bit of technical. Uh, manipulation and not all patients can be offered that. Um, the radial artery is a, it's a good option provided um, we um, intelligently uh, decide on the um, recipient target because this is this is a muscular artery and if we um, we have to always been we have to always select a target where there's almost complete proximal block and the distal flow is very good. Otherwise, the radial artery will go into spasm and uh, cause problems. And there's another point. Uh, following the grafting of a radial artery, we would start the patient on uh, calcium channel blockers for uh, uh, six to six months to one year. And that has to be maintained uh, to prevent uh, coronary artery going into spasm. And this is the reason why not all the patients who undergo CABG have a scar in, the, in their forearm. Um, arterial Conduits are almost always preferred over venous conduits, but there are the options like gastropiploic artery uh, is not very popular because you have to um, dissect into the abdominal cavity and uh, devascular the stomach. Uh, the good old saphenous vein is always there for, at our disposal uh, for the rest of the uh, conduits that we need. So this is what we do with the uh, left internal memory. It is harvested with its uh, the surrounding tissues and anastomos in the LAD. And rest of the grafts will be anastomos just distal to the blocks. And the proximal end, the top end, will be anastomos to the aorta. Uh, the saphenous vein harvesting 
side will have this kind of um, a little bit long scar, but it's not usually deep, it's a superficial vein. And usually the patients have a good recovery by the time they get discharged and wound is, uh, wound is almost healed. But uh, they might present to you with uh, some wound complaints and uh, you you might have to manage uh, manage these wounds. They are not deep wounds and it's uh, one portion that you have to be taken that had to be taken is that because these patients, some of them may be diabetic, you have to make sure that you practice good uh, um, tissue care so that the wound uh, doesn't get complicated. Then uh, just a bit about the technical aspect of uh, um, how, how we do a bypass drafting because uh, you might have heard there's on-pump grafting, on-pump uh, on CABG, off-pump CABG, and minimal access CABG. So just to answer a patient's question, you might, uh, it might be beneficial to know a little bit. To work on the heart for CABG, for valves, or any, any kind of operation, where we, especially where we open into the heart, you have to, you have to, um, you might, you have to stop the heart and you have to uh, get some other means of uh, oxygenation and perfusion uh, pumping uh, while you are working on the heart. So we have this machine called the cardiopulmonary bypass machine, which had been invented in uh, 1950s. And uh, it's currently uh, a well-developed, uh, quite advanced and reliable, almost foolproof uh, machine. Uh, it is... Um, usually handled by uh, two perfusionists. We essentially need two people to man uh, manage this when we are doing an operation. And uh, the blood is drained from the, we cannulate the, uh, the vena cava or the right atrium and blood drains into the machine where it will get uh, filtered. And then uh, the gas blender will oxygenate the, um, the blood. And uh, depending on the like temperature we need the patient to be in, we, we might cool the patient to reduce the metabolism of the of the body, so that uh, uh, when the metabolism goes down, we, it's uh, the perfusion um, demands are uh, easy to be met with. Then we have the pump that will um, pump the blood in back into the aorta, so with the cannula that we usually insert in the ascending aorta. So when this is done, the lung and the heart is spared, and we can stop the heart uh, by injecting. Uh, a solution called cardioplegia into the uh, coronaries. They have high potassium content, which will uh, uh, stop the heart in diastole. So, uh, but we have to be always take a lot of precautions on um, avoiding uh, ischemic injury to the heart and to make sure that the heart will function optimally when we uh, get the heart to work back again. Uh, this is again the machine, and these are the two lines: the venous line uh, with dark blood going into the machine, and the uh, arterial, uh, the oxygenated blood going back uh, to the aorta. So that's the on-pump uh, CABG. When we perform CABG, stopping the heart helps us a lot because we can uh, easily uh, manipulate the heart, and uh, we can uh, uh, do an optimum anastomosis on this uh, on the still heart. It's especially useful when you when you have bad um, um, disease on the uh, base of the heart and uh, there are long segments of uh, uh, disease in the coronaries. Then there's the other option of uh, off-pump surgery where uh, the patient, the heart is beating and the heart is maintaining the perfusion of the rest of the body. Um, the, the area that we work on is stabilized by uh, this um, Stabilizers. This is called an octopus. The arm you see, the light bluish arm. And uh, with that, we work on the the, the coronary that we are anastomosing is also uh, perfusing the rest of the um, heart. So we have to keep the perfusion going on and uh, anastomose the bottom end. And this is a good option, especially very specially for people who who might uh, fare bad with. Um, um, the pump being a um, the extracorporeal circulation. 
uh, some of the times, especially when people have uh, renal disease, their renal functions might go down and uh, there's an amount of vasoplegia coming up uh, due to extraoperative circulation, circulation. So in off-pump surgery, there are these benefits. But on the other hand, uh, um, uh, going on pump is also a kind of, uh, uh, over the years, it's again uh, uh, safe safe procedure. So depending on the need, we, uh, we might, and depending on the need and the anatomy of the um, obstructions, we will uh, offer the patient both uh, off-pump and on-pump options. Then there's a minimally invasive uh, CABG, which I will not go deeply, but the, in, in that case, the incision is usually a thoracotomy. So you won't have a, uh, the sternotomy that uh, usually uh, the CABG patients have. And the pain is uh, may, may be uh, less compared to the sternotomy, but uh, uh, it's, it can easily <coughs> uh, anastomose the lima to a lady. And if there are other arteries involved, we might be able to do the same, the same access, but sometimes uh, we have to have the hybrid option of uh, uh, getting the cardiologist to uh, deal with the rest of the uh, blocks. This is again off pump where the heart is mobilized and uh, the anastomosis is done in the uh, back of the heart. The anesthetist has to uh, make sure that the uh, Cardiac perfusion is maintained, and uh, we have the pump on backup in case uh, we need to go on pump. So, perioperative care in CABG, starting with uh, preoperative management. Uh, in our setting, there will be patients who are in the waiting list for cardiac surgeries in the government hospitals who will present you while they are waiting for the cardiac surgery. So maybe months to years, depending on the on the, on the list and the condition they have. So you will have to manage these patients and optimize these patients uh, to the best level you can. Uh, Preoperative optimization involves strict glycemic control, depending on the time gap. Ideally, these people, ideally, these all these patients should get a CABG done as soon as possible. But if you, I mean, depending on the time you have, uh, any form of optimizing glycemic control helps because it improves the prognos prognosis immensely, especially wound healing and other uh, uh, aspects of recovery. Hypertension control, smoking cessation, uh, promoting smoking cessation is very important. And uh, withholding antiplatelets is another thing that comes in preoperative um, management. You have to stop clopidogrel um, seven days prior to surgery and uh, it's like prasugrel about seven days. But the current trend is to continue aspirin uh, either without stopping or um, to stop it uh, two or three days before and start it uh, on the day of the surgery. Another <clears throat> point I would uh, like to um, tell you is the screening for carotid disease because these patients, when they the fact that they have carotid uh, sorry coronary atherosclerosis means that the same pathologies can be there in any of the uh, vessels in their body. So we have to be vigilant about uh, carotid disease and we usually make them undergo carotid duplex scans if they are more than 50 years and, they, and even younger people if they have a higher risk, uh, very high risk. So once they, once they identify a significant block, we have to be careful when we do the surgery to maintain the condition. And sometimes if they are, see, according to the guidelines, if the to collective total of the both sides, the percentage is more than 140, we get the vascular surgeon to intend. Uh, another little point uh, about uh, coronary vascularization. So as well as the myocardium that is ischemic, the mitral, mitral valve can get affected uh, by uh, myocardial ischemia because the, the, the papillary muscles can get uh, ischemic or they can get ruptured and the annulus can get dilated. So for, for these reasons, there may be an amount of mitral regurgitation in these patients. And uh, if it's severe, if it's, if, it's, if it's mild, they will um, uh, 
ABG or PCI might manage the MR and it will recover. But if it's severe, the patient has to undergo a mitral uh, repair uh, while we do the CABG. Postoperatively, we restart the antiplatelets on day zero itself. After the surgery, within uh, within six hours, if the if there's no significant bleeding, we start aspirin uh, with a loading dose of up to 300 and then continue aspirin lifelong. And then um, clopidogrel is uh, started uh, usually on day one. And again, depending on the uh, the complexity of the problem, it may be it might go up to one year if we stopped, or we might have to continue. So this is a headache for most of the um, surgical colleagues and aesthetists because these patients uh, can't promptly undergo surgical procedures. So you have to be uh, vigilant on that and you can uh, usually, if the patient is, uh, uh, is OCABG, you can uh, assess the patient, get the anesthetist and the cartilage help if needed. And you might have to stop the clopidogrel um, uh, five days before for the routine surgery. And aspirin, in our practice, we usually continue. And uh, you, you, you can uh, have the choice of uh, stopping it a few days earlier or continuing it. Statins has a, a good a big prognostic benefit. Started Atostatin started usually on day one and continued lifelong. Spirolactone uh, beta blockers again have prognostic benefits and they are uh, started uh, whenever the hemodynamics uh, allow us. And pre op routine medication for diabetes, hypothyroidism, and uh, uh, any other condition should be started and continued as, as needed. So let's move on to uh, cardiac uh, valvular surgery. And uh, some of the aspects of the wound care and the sternotomy I will discuss later uh, in, in, in the latter part of the presentation. Uh, uh, <laughs> That's uh, that may be uh, applied to the CABD patients. So, valvular surgery is um, another common thing that happens in cardiac theaters. And what you see here is a, a um, aortic valve that is critically stenosis. And you you will notice that it's, it doesn't have this uh, bends. Um, once it is bends, um, the appearance. Here it's a bicuspid valve, but what has happened is the right aortic cusp and the non coronary cusp has fused, probably congenitally, and that has led to a uh, bicuspid, functionally bicuspid valve, which has a tendency to become um, calcified and uh, get stenosed. So this calcification, when it progresses, it, it can... Uh, even involve the annulus, and then you have uh, the his bundle going, uh, going right here, and then the mitral anterior little uh, of mitral just under this, and there are uh, the coronary ostia. So you have to remove all this calcium uh, when you replace the valve, and you have to be careful about the conduction uh, systems. This is the algorithm of management for aortic stenosis. I won't go deep, but uh, you, you, I'm, I'm sure you know that uh, symptomatic aortic stenosis, symptomatic uh, critical aortic stenosis needs uh, surgical aortic valve replacement, or if it's a high risk patient, TAVI is an option, but uh, currently not in Sri Lanka. And um, um, asymptomatic patients, if the Ejection fraction is dropping, or if the uh, exercise tolerance is impaired, might uh, be uh, indicated surgical replacement. Then, aortic regurgitation, again the same, symptomatic uh, surgery, and uh, asymptomatic with uh, dropping ejection fraction or dilating left ventricle um, will need surgery. Mitral stenosis is a very common condition, relatively common condition in our part of the world, due to mostly due to rheumatic disease. So what you see in the top picture is the fish mouth appearance of the uh, rheumatic mitral valve. Uh, this is a normal mitral valve. Uh, just forget about this uh, sutures. I mean, uh, this is a mitral valve that, that's uh, awaiting repair. But uh, this is how the usual uh, anterior and posterior cusps will look like. 
but with rheumatic disease, they get uh, thickened, calcified, and finally fused. So it will end up like this. The first line management is uh, usually uh, PTMC by the cardiologist, provided it's not contraindicated. And uh, if once that fails, and with time, uh, later on, the patient will need uh, mitral uh, valve replacement. Regurgitation is again the same. Uh, one one thing about regurgitation is that uh, degenerative uh, mitral regurgitation has a very good chance of repair. We commonly uh, do that in, in Sri Lanka, and uh, this uh, it, it it has a it's more beneficial for the patient. Uh, the repair is more beneficial to the patient rather than a replacement. So when you get these kind of patients and uh, when they ask for advice, it's something that you better uh, know and give them. Repair involves uh, preserving the native coronary valves, valve anatomy, and uh, there's no need of offering, as we will, we will later discuss, and there's no need of uh, redo surgery as in biological valve. But if you have to do replacement, uh, you have to remove the valve, remove the native valve, and then uh, insert an artificial mechanical or biological valve. And uh, the biological, uh, the mechanical valves are usually made of titanium with the carbon coating. And uh, currently, they are they are quite advanced. And they are good, but uh, still, uh, the patient has to be maintained on uh, long-term, lifelong warfarin treatment uh, to make sure that there, the, there are no clot forming uh, on the surface of the valves. But the good point is that uh, the, this vessel, this uh, valve outlasts the patient, and usually you don't have to. Um, uh, plan a redo surgery as in a biological valve where the valve degenerates by about 15 years and uh, if, if the patient survives that that long you might have to do a redo but biological valves doesn't need offering and uh, how we um, how we uh, decide on offering a valve is usually younger patients patients who are less than 60 to 65 will get a mechanical valve and continue on lifelong offering, while a patient who has uh, lesser than 15 years of uh, life expectancy should better, will better uh, pair with the um, biological valve. A little bit about uh, valve repair. It is commonly done for uh, mitral valves. And aortic is a bit complex, but again, there are options like Osaki and other uh, valve repair techniques. Um, especially mitral regurgitation has a good um, tendency to be um, successful in our repairs. And these patients, uh, there's an armament of uh, techniques that we practice, the different techniques depending on the pathology. And uh, but universally at the end, we will insert uh, a ring, annuloplasty ring on these patients. And um, that will keep the uh, annulus in shape and uh, the correct size. Sometimes, so, I mean, some of us uh, commonly start the patient on warfarin for a short duration of time uh, because this uh, annular ring is there. And this can be stopped uh, maximally in, in, in a few, few months. So uh, essentially, well, repair patients doesn't have to be on warfarin. And you have to make sure that any offering that was started for a ring will be stopped uh, in a, once the plan time is uh, gone. About anticoagulation, these patients with metallic valves, once they are discharged, you will come across, they, they, they usually essentially need uh, almost normal life. So you will come across them in uh, any, any um, field of medicine that you work on. Um, one important thing is that Warfarin daily, lifelong is a must. And uh, there's still no place for uh, other um, anti uh, anticoagulants. Uh, Apixaban still is not uh, indicated. Only uh, Currently, it's only warfarin. And uh, the target INR is around 2.5. And uh, this 
there's a new valve called Onyx, which which might it will be okay with a, uh, a lesser INR. And these patients should always avoid vitamin K containing drugs and foods. But when they present with um, present you, they may have an infection or any other condition, and you might have to uh, offer them uh, medication, um, especially antibiotics. They can this any I mean most of the drugs can interact with the uh, offering uh, their metabolism and change the INR. So once you manage these patients, whatever the condition they come, you have to make sure that they their INR. You have to do an INR and make sure that it's it's uh, maintained properly. Otherwise, if the INR goes low, there's a tendency for valve thrombosis and the patient might even die. And if it goes too high, there's a risk of uh, bleeding, which can also be fatal if it's an ICH or uh, similar events. Breaching, so when you have to do a surgery in this kind of patients, a surgical procedure, you have to bridge warfarin with um, possibly enoxaparin. You have to stop uh, warfarin five days before the procedure. And uh, you might have to admit the patient to keep them on enoxaparin until the day before the surgery. And uh, you have to start warfarin on day zero when the uh, provided that the bleeding has stopped and continue enoxaparin until the INR comes up to at least uh, 2.0. You can stop stop it once that there, and you have to make sure that the uh, enoxaparin dose is titrated properly uh, on long term, and the patient is back to its usual uh, open um, follow up. If there's an emergency, you will have to consider um, replacing with um, blood products or with uh, IM vitamin K, and you can get the hematology opinion depending on the. Uh, condition and this, uh, the need. Uh, another important point is these this, uh, artificial valves. If they get infective endocarditis, it's unlike um, uh, native valve infective endocarditis, it's very difficult to treat and you, you might have to uh, uh, remove the valve itself and uh, replace it. So it's very, it's vital that you treat any infection in these kind of patients promptly and uh, save the trouble of um, having uh, prosthetic valve infected endocarditis. Uh, a little bit about infective endocarditis. As you would know, it's, it's, a, it's a medical disease. You have infection of the usually the valves and um, they, uh, usually it is managed with uh, antibiotics, long-term antibiotics. But still, the surgeon comes into play, especially when the infection doesn't get uh, controlled by the medication. And uh, when there are vegetations more than uh, 10 millimeters in size, and uh, when there's a risk of embolism. So there are set guidelines. Again, EAC and HA has uh, guidelines. And uh, you, it's, it's just for, you to, for your knowledge that the, we sometimes have to intervene when there's a severe infector. Specific forms of infective endocarditis. Then, a little bit word about uh, aortic dissection. Aortic surgery is a, uh, it's a um, very liked um, um, field in cardiac surgery. There are aortic dissections, aortic um, aneurysms uh, that has to be managed. And uh, currently, I have noticed that in Sri Lanka, uh, like in, in the European countries, we, we diagnose aortic dissections common. Uh, compared to uh, other countries in our, in our region, uh, this diagnosis and management is it's a very good plus point in our health system. Uh, usually, this, this is uh, manifested in uh, poorly controlled hypertension, hypertensive patients. And most of them are young patients who didn't know that they are hypertensive and the aberration was so bad. Uh, the dissection is happens in the involving the endothelium and like the dissection it, it extends up to the uh, the muscle layer of the aorta and it extends uh, it can extend either way along distally or proximally. Uh, there are there's a range of complications that can occur. Uh, 
uh, if the dissection extends proximally, the valve can get uh, uh, regurgitant and there will be severe heart failure. Coronaries can get affected, leading to MI. Carotids, stroke. And lumbar vessels uh, can lead to paraplegia if when they uh, 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 when the spinal cord is ischemic, and the mesenteric ischemia can lead to bowel gangrene, uh, renal failure if the renal vessels are defective, and uh, uh, limbs uh, can go ischemic once the uh, dissection extends uh, into the iliac vessels. Surgery is again. Uh, Indicated depending on the type, the anatomy of the dissection and the complications that they have. There's, there are two um, classifications, Stanford and DeBakey, but the idea is that uh, uh, Stanford classification is more clearer. Uh, if the dissection is proximal in the proximal aorta, ascending uh, aorta and the arch, uh, descending flap is in the ascending aorta and the arch, that means the opening into the uh, muscle layer is in the proximal segment, ascending out and the arch proximal to the uh, left subclavian artery. The patients, uh, considering the risk versus benefit rate uh, balance, patient will fare better with the uh, replacement of that segment with the dactron graft. But if it's if it's type B, only involving the distal segment with the opening uh, distal to the left subclavian, we usually do not operate these patients and uh, they can be managed with uh, endovascular um, uh, stents and uh, uh, if possible and uh, manage conservatively. So this is how an aortic dissection looks like. And then we have to, uh, in summary, what we do is uh, we have to stop the heart and we have to stop the circulation of the whole body until we do the, because we have to re remove the uh, proximal aorta. And we cool the patient to 18 degrees Celsius. And then um, we have about 15 minutes safe margin to replace the uh, disease segment with an electron graft. Um, that, is, that is done in the cardiac centers in Sri Lanka. So whenever you come across a patient with um, uh, the, where you suspect uh, aortic dissection, uh, please uh, discuss with the cardiologist and uh, if you need cardiologist help, always uh, you are welcome. So a little bit about sternotomy. Uh, our approach to the heart is always through the sternum. We make a midline incision and then split the sternum in, in, in the middle and uh, spread spread the sternum. And we have good access to the anterior medial sternum and heart. So almost always we have we do this unless it's a minimally invasive procedure. And uh, once we finish, we usually wire up the sternum with uh, uh, these sternal wires. And it's a solid uh, rewiring. And usually, we don't have any problem. And these wires currently are MRI compatible. So that's a common question that you come across uh, when you have to uh, make these patients undergo MRI. But if it's a uh, if it's a surgery done some time back, you have to be a little bit cautious. Uh, I can only assure you that the newer sternal uh, wires are MRI compatible. Uh, but it's always good to check. So this is the incision that you get, and the, uh, this uh, small um, incisions of where the drains came out. Some of the patients, especially when they are prone to hypertrophic scar or keloid scar, might have scar issues. And if they present you with the scar tenderness or uh, scar um, hypertrophy or keloid, you have to uh, be mindful to make sure that this, it's not infected. Uh, just check for the signs of inflammation, and uh, you have to make sure that the sternum is stable uh, and all refer to us. Or you can assess when the patient is coughing, you have to uh, press on both ends of the sternum to make sure it's not moved. Because uh, if there's an infection, the wiring can get uh, loose and there can be uh, osteomyelitis, and uh, we have to manage that promptly. It's very rare, very, very rare. But if, if some patient presents you with a problem in the sternal, sternal uh, incision, uh, please be mindful. So just to show you some x-rays that will make you uh, wonder, this is how these uh, wires will look like in a post-cardiac uh, surgery patient. And you can see the valve, this is a tissue valve. 
uh, index, right? So my well. And uh, sometimes you would see these uh, clips. These are the uh, clips that we use to um, uh, like get the branches of the graphs we use can use. This is uh, let me do the memory clicks and uh, happiness. Um, so again, the wound should heal 100%. There shouldn't be any discharge or any signs of inflammation. Another thing is the pa these post sternotomy, these patients should not lift or push or pull um, any force, a significant po uh, force up to about three months because the, any force coming along the upper limbs of the shoulder will be transmitted to the sternum. So we advise them not to lift, push or pull um, in the first three months. Um, and then um, after that, they can do anything they want while um, swimming, anything is okay. Uh, driving by themselves is okay by about uh, two months and returning work depends on the uh, type of uh, type of uh, uh, the profession that they are involved in so we give all this advice uh, by the time we discharge and uh, one, one point you should know is that upper limb should be kept um, uh, free for the first few uh, few months but they should be mobilized from day one uh, apart from the upper limb issue the patient should be uh, mobilized uh, I I I uh, promote walking, and uh, they should walk by the time by one month time. They be target to about uh, four kilometers of walking, but not not everybody obviously achieves this. And then uh, chest physiotherapy, incentive spirometer, and uh, chest physiotherapy is a must. Uh, so this is about uh, immediate post op, and uh, once the three months passed and the uh, patient has a good recovery, uh, they can lead uh, a normal life, but. Since these patients had the risk factors for coronary artery disease, they should always be careful uh, to continue the um, prevention, uh, managing hypertension, diabetes, um, and then uh, lipid control and all that. So just a brief uh, word about cardiac trauma. Uh, cardiac and thoracic trauma is a... It's a, it's a uh, Topic on itself, so I I, don't, I won't uh, go deep into it. Um, it's common to have thoracic trauma, and uh, pneumothorax, hemothorax, uh, frail chest. They they need to be discussed in detail. Just about the cardiac aspect, if a patient is uh, having um, um, compromised um, uh, compromised uh, hemodynamics, you have to be always vigilant, even on blunt trauma, that there is a cardiac tamponade. And in that case, you will uh, relieving the tamponade uh, will be quite beneficial in the uh, R room. And uh, you have to suspect major aortic injuries, uh, aortic transection, if uh, when when there's uh, severe, they might present as uh, severe uh, massive hemothorax. And when when another uh, important point is when there's penetrating injuries, tab injuries, uh, especially to the heart, you should never pull out the weapon. And you should uh, send the patient to a um, to a center where we can uh, assess the patient. And uh, sometimes you might have have to arrange I and mean, uh, get the patient to undergo cardiopulmonary bypass on the machine and then uh, pull out the um, pull out the weapons. So we have uh, trauma centers in Colombo, Gaul, Candy, and Jaffna, and you can always uh, ring up the on-call person and get uh, any help uh, when managing these patients uh, whenever needed. So uh, with the uh, 10.25, and uh, with that, I would like to um, wind up. And uh, I hope you got uh, some practically useful um, knowledge on the things that we do. So um, uh, I would... Um, Welcome you for any any questions. And uh, as I said, if you need any cardiothoric help, uh, there are on-call consultants in, in our centers and you can always uh, ring up and uh, call, call us for help. We are always there. Thank you.
Thank you for your informative lecture, sir. We have one question in the chat. Uh, when can post CABG patients drive a vehicle have sexual intercourse? Well, um, as I said, the upper limbs, keeping the upper limbs uh, is uh, like free is the issue, and otherwise the car, we 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 need the patient to uh, to be to kind of uh, be exertive. So in, when it comes to uh, sexual intercourse, you have to be. Um, uh, I wouldn't give a specific time interval, but you should you have to be vigilant that uh, until that uh, time interval where the sternum is fully healed. You should not uh, have any force coming on your shoulders. I would just leave it there rather than going deep. And uh, about driving, depending if, if it's a if it's a uh, if it's a heavy vehicle, we would advise them uh, to delay it. But if it's a light vehicle with uh, I mean automatic can I mean uh, power power steering and all that uh, within uh, one to two months, it's safe. But uh, you have to be careful that uh, when you whatever you do, um, again the uh, you have to be vigilant on the sternum. Uh, this uh, when when it's the same thing is asked about bicycles. I advise them to uh, uh, delay uh, the motorcycles a little bit because when they I mean it's okay to ride it, but some they have to uh, take the weight on, uh, when they uh, push it. So um, again, you have to be like that three month interval is it's vital. I hope that answers. Thank you, sir. Then uh, there are a few more questions. Uh, what is the LDL target for CABG patient? Well, that's interesting. Uh, now, whatever the LDL level they had. Now, what we I mean, rather than going for a rather than going for a, a specific target. What I would say is recently this came up in uh, some of the conferences and in uh, uh, in the cardiology conferences. They got the disease with whatever the uh, whatever the LDL they had. So going down, going down on LDL uh, is always beneficial because even if they had normal LDL, if this caused the coronary artery disease, then even coming coming down on that uh, normal levels is always beneficial and and. Uh, uh, the studies show that I mean we we always start the patient on statins uh, post-operatively, uh, despite them having uh, normal normal um, cholesterol levels. So it's always beneficial to come down on the LDL levels. And if you um, prefer, I mean, even for uh, patients, uh, non-surgical patients, this is currently uh, getting into practice. And another point I would like to raise is. Uh, our labs, they they give a normal range as such, but uh, ideally, it's like ideally this uh, hundred around this more than hundred range should come down to around. It's beneficial even to come down to around sixties uh, in these patients. So um, our advice, the cardiology advice and the surgical advice, is to come down on the level of cholesterol you have because whatever it is, it it, it cause trouble. Then uh, can a female mechanical valve become pregnant? I'm, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, the problem is if we offer them uh, a tissue valve, they will have to undergo uh, re redo surgery later on to uh, once they um, once they have completed the family. So currently, one option is obviously one option earlier was to uh, replace with the tissue valve, and then once the family is completed, do to do a redo procedure to replace with the mechanical valve but now in even in sri lanka uh, we can offer them to have a mechanical valve and they should uh, take the responsibility where they will have a pre planned pregnancy and uh, they will they will have to uh, bridge the warfarin in the first trimester first few weeks with um, uh, low molecular weight heparin and usually these patients are admitted by the uh, obstetricians and they manage the initial uh, weeks with uh, uh, low, uh, low molecular weight heparin. And then uh, just before the, th then they can be restarted on warfarin and sent home. And just before the delivery or the cesarean section, they will uh, stop the, I mean, uh, maybe a weeks before, a few weeks before uh, 
the due date, they will stop the warfarin and restart on uh, low molecular weight heparin. So that saves the trouble of uh, undergoing surgery and uh, delaying the surgery. I mean, most of the time, these patients can't undergo a pregnancy or a delivery with the uh, pathological valves they have. So currently, this is where we stand. And do we need CT and GO4 CABG? As I said, we need a coronary, um, it's, uh, the traditional angiogram we do because CT angio will show um, the, the calcium, I mean, that will give a calcium score. That will, uh, I'm sure, cardiologically will uh, explain you. That gives a calcium score and that gives a, a fairly um, accurate reading of the uh, coronary disease, extent of coronary disease. But what we are interested in is, is how much lumen is retained because in our decision making, we usually graft a vessel that is uh, that is having less than 30% um, uh, of the normal coronary diameter uh, area left in that. So anything more than 70% block has to undergo grafting. And uh, in it comes to uh, left main and LED, it's uh, anything more than 50%. So for this, we need the uh, conventional uh, CT and sorry, conventional angiogram. So see, if patients can undergo the patients who undergo the uh, conventional angiogram doesn't need a CT angiogram. But if you are worried about the, uh, the, invas uh, the invasiveness and the issues with the contrast um, in um, conventional angiogram and you need to do a uh, CT and geo for screening purposes, you can discuss with uh, our cardiological league, then there's a, there's a place. But if again, if you need to undergo CABG, you need to uh, repeat with the uh, conventional angiogram before CABG or uh, intervention. Contraindications to uh, cardiopulmonary bypass, there's uh, uh, in a root, I mean, in a routine patient, uh, for example, when the patient is having um, CKD, we, uh, if there's an option of not going under cardiopulmonary bypass and if the patient can be managed with the off-pump uh, surgery for CABG, we can try to offer that. But sometimes it's not possible and the patient has to undergo cardiopulmonary bypass. So even um, patients with um, end renal failure, if there's a prognostic benefit, uh, discussing with the nephrologists and all, uh, provided they have a KT in the transplant plan later on, we might get the patient to undergo uh, cardiopulmonary bypass and uh, then manage the manage the consequences later. Um, that's all of the questions. Yeah, thank you very much, sir. So, our thank sincere you. thanks to Dr. Pal in the Bandar again, consultant cardiothoracic surgeon. Teaching Hospital Jaffna for his excellent lecture and precious time. And dear participants, please find the link in the chat box and give your feedback and answer the post assessment questions to receive your e certificate. Let's conclude today's session. Thank you, everyone.